Good evening. Welcome back to Algebra. It's wonderful to be on what we consider home ground again. You know that Algebra is now in multiple cities, but this for us is always home because we started here and this is where we feel most like we know everybody and we hope everybody knows and loves us in return. There's a bunch of new faces tonight, so I'd love to tell you a little bit about the intent of Algebra. We started in September 2016, um, born out of the intent to create a space where you come to for critical, urgent, provocative, dissenting, interesting conversations with the people who make your world and ours. But really at the heart of Algebra is the idea of community because it is not only about what you hear, it is about engaging with a group of like-minded people who you, who you may or may not encounter in the real world, but who share the same mindset, the share in, shared the same intent. As part of that, Algebra is now in four cities. We are, of course, here in Gurgaon in Delhi. We are also in Bangalore in Chennai. We are absolutely delighted to say, starting this month, we are in Hyderabad as well. At the end of April, on April 27th, we kick off the Hyderabad chapter. We'd love you to share with us names of people you think would be interested. We're, one, we're happy to invite them to join us uh, in Hyderabad for the first evening. And we hope we can expand this community of the like-minded across the country. A few notes for tonight, uh, both Bibek De Broy as well as Ashutosh have new books and a host of books out. Both are available outside and we hope you will use the opportunity to buy them and have them signed. For those of you who are interested in knowing about membership, a few who are guests tonight have asked us, we do have business cards available at the desk outside. Please take them, get in touch with one of us and we'll be happy to tell you more. As always, there are people to thank who have made Algebra possible. Thank you first and foremost to this wonderful space, the DLF Club 5, for having us back. We don't see you often enough, but we will be here again two weeks from now, and I'll just come to that in a minute. Thank you, as always, to our returning friends and partners at Terra Chips and at Fab India, who are partners with us not just here, but in multiple locations. And, of course, those who started it, those who still keep us in the best spirits, the Glenlivet, three years and drinking, Thank you to the Glen Livet. Um, I did say we'll be back here in two weeks because I'm giving you an early heads up to block April 14th when we have Rajat Gupta, who has been, of course, in the news all the more recently because he's published his memoirs. Rajat Gupta was, of course, as we know, the former head of McKinsey. And after a very, very a staggering arc of success and then failure, one would call it, also on an epic scale, it's time to talk to him, see what he has learned about falling, failing, and redemption. You'll receive more details on that as um, the weeks progress, but block that date. Now to our first conversation this evening, and it is my privilege to both host this conversation as well as to introduce the speaker. Now the next time you say, I don't have the time for that as an excuse for anything at all, I want you to visualize Bibek De Broy. He is in his day job, he already has more than most people put on their plates in a lifetime. He is chairman of the PM's Economic Advisory Council. He has held a host of positions in government, in academia. He has done a host of scholarly work in economics. He has made significant contributions to economic theory, to game theory, to uh, economic and social inequalities, and to poverty. But that is just one part of what he does. In his, what is called his passion, not his profession, but really the amount of time he has devoted to it, it has to be a parallel profession. He is possibly the most formidable translator and scholar, one of the most formidable translators and scholars of Indian epics and myths in living memory. He has become only the third person ever to translate the unabridged Mahabharat. Now, to put that in context, that's 2.25 million words. It's a feat he accomplished in less than six years, in five years, publishing two volumes a year. That's almost unheard of, but not just that. He has also translated the Valmiki Ramayana, the Bhagavad Puranas in a bridge form and is starting on the unabridged, the Harivamsha, the Bhagavad Gita. I think just the Ramayana and the Mahabharata put together, there's only one other person who has ever accomplished that feat. So this is a man who not only knows how to get things done, he knows how to stretch both ends of the candle to get them done. Tonight, we'll be in conversation with him about that aspect of his life and work. I know a lot of you are interested in also talking to him about the economy. Well, let's just say at this moment, he doesn't share your interest back. 
We will have uh, questions as well, because I'm sure you have a lot of them. The phone number will go on. We would appreciate if you could keep them to the subject of tonight's conversation. And if he is free to join us for a drink after, you're welcome to ask him anything he cares to answer privately. For the moment, though, it is my privilege to invite on stage Bibek De Broy. So, Bibek, before we get into the epics themselves, how did an economics student, you went to Presidency College, you went to Delhi College of e uh, Economics, you went to Trinity College at, at Cambridge, that alone is a lot of work. How did an economics student find a passion for the epics? And what was that seeking that led you there? Well, you thank you, by the way, for inviting me here. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to Algebra. You were suggesting in the question as if it was a very, very conscious decision. When I look back, it was never a conscious decision. At least I now realize it wasn't a conscious, conscious decision. It was a succession of coincidences and events that led me to pursue this particular path. So I'll just mention the initial triggers and then we can revisit the question. The initial two triggers were several, several years ago and both of them happened more or less at the same time. There was a professor of economics. He was a left-wing Marxist. His name was Professor Ashok Rudra. He used to be a professor at the University of Vishwabharati in Shantiniketan and I used to teach economics in Presidency College, Kolkata in those days. And I knew him and once in a while I would visit him. And quite evidently our views on economics were somewhat different. So he was somewhat contemptuous of my views on economics and showed it. I reciprocated the sentiments but dared not show it. So therefore, by mutual consent, we decided to talk on other things like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And he had a set of the Sanskrit Mahabharata with him. One day, very, very casually, I remarked that in the Mahabharata, it says that the five Pandavas became accomplished in the use of different sets of weapons, like Bhima for the Gada, Arjuna in all weapons, so on and so forth. What happens if one does a statistical test to see whether there is any significant difference in the way the Pandavas use these weapons in the Mahabharata? Most of the people would have said, you are crazy, go away. Ashok Rudra, to his eternal credit, said, here's my copy of the Mahabharata, why don't you go and simply test it? So I sat down, tested it, an essay came out of that. So that was the, one of the first triggers. The second trigger, more or less at the same time, I encountered two shlokas written by two different poets, neither of whom we can satisfactorily date. The first one is Valmiki, Valmiki Ramayan, the first poet, Adi Kavi, and the second one is Kalidasa. In the Valmiki Ramayana, if you remember, Ram knows that Sita is in Lanka and is waiting to invade Lanka, but has to wait because it is the monsoon. And he has to wait until the monsoon is over. And Valmiki describes the monsoon. Mal Valmiki was a great poet in terms of describing nature. And don't worry, I shall translate. So Valmiki says, Vidyut pataka savalaka mala shailendra kuta kriti sannikasha garjanti megha samudirna nada matta gajendra evasang yugastha. The clouds are tinged with lightning. They are garlanded with cranes. Those clouds are thundering. 
and the clouds are like elephants and what are these elephants doing? These elephants are fighting and remember Rama was waiting to fight. Kalidasa in Megdutam, those of you who know the Megdutam will know that there is not much of a story in the Megdutam. There is a Yaksha who has been banished by his lord and master Kuvair for one year. He is pining for his beloved and he sees a cloud and sends the cloud as a messenger to his wife who is in the capital city of Kuvair. So the cloud goes in the first part of the poem, in the second half of the poem the cloud comes back. And Kalidasa says right towards the beginning of Megdutam, again I shall translate, Asharasya Prathama Divase Megham Ashlishta Sanum Vapra Krida Parinathagaja Prekshaniyam Dadarsha First day in the month of Ashar, there are the clouds, the clouds resemble the mountains and the clouds also resemble elephants. And what are the elephants doing? The elephants are playing. And here is the Yaksha who doesn't want to fight. He's pining for his beloved. Here are two poets, both of whom look at the monsoon clouds and the image that comes to their minds is that of elephants. Except in the case of Valmiki, the elephants are fighting. In the case of Kalidas, the elephants are playing. When I read these two, I thought if I do not read this literature, I am missing out on life. So in a way, that's how the journey started. Did you know Sanskrit when you started? No, I did not. Uh, it's, it's a process of progressively learning. I, when you normally learn a language, you first learn to speak it. Then you learn how to read it. And then you learn how to write it. For me, it was... A reverse process because I was first interested in uh, reading it then in writing and eventually in conversing so my converse, conversational Sanskrit is sort of in the last 10 years in fact properly speaking I began to learn Sanskrit when I was about 45 but it picked up when I was about 50 and you've said, and we were speaking of this earlier, that uh, while there are a lot of people who do know Sanskrit, you don't normally encounter them in your everyday life to have conversations. And so he said that he spoke Sanskrit to his three dogs uh, because they make good listeners. Has that helped? Do they now know Sanskrit? No, because absolutely right. You see, you do not have practice of conversing. And if you want to keep your con conversational skills going, you need to converse with someone. And since you mentioned dogs, that was another of these coincidences. Many, many years ago, I wrote a book on attitudes to dogs in our texts, by which I mean primarily Hindu texts, but also Buddhist texts. And this manuscript was called Sarama and Her Children. Sarama, for those of you who do not know, is the mother of all dogs and is also the dog of the gods, which is why one of the names for dogs is Saramea. So I had this manuscript called Sarama and her children. Believe it or not, it is the only one of my manuscripts which was refused by 14 publishers. And then I went to Penguin. Penguin said, yes, yes, great manuscript, we shall print it. But wait a minute, we've been thinking for a while about a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Will you do a translation of the Bhagavad Gita? I said, of course, I'd be happy to. So it was not quite a quid pro quo, but it was almost one. <laughs> so I did a translation of the Bhagavad Gita, and please don't quote me on this. Uh, so Penguin said, do you want the dog book first or do you want the God book first? <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter to me. So the Bhagavad Gita was published, then Sarama and her children were published. And by the time I translated the Bhagavad Gita, I was a bit more confident about my skills with translating Sanskrit. And therefore I hazarded, um, I tried to translate the Mahabharata. So before we will just move on to the epics, one last question. Do you find that economics and the epics in some way, do you find these two passions feed into each other or are they just parallel tracks for you? And if they do intersect, then where do they intersect? 
they are not parallel tracks. Well, they are parallel tracks, but they are parallel tracks more from the point of view of time management. But if you think of our texts, and maybe we can come back to this, our texts have an enormous, enormous quantity of material on what we would call political economy today, on what we would call governance today, on what we would call the rule of law today. It's just that most of the time when we encounter these texts, we encounter abridged and simplified versions of these texts, and the simplified versions naturally tend to pick on stories, but there's much, much more in these texts than just stories, and therefore, these texts are replete with views on the economy, and I'm not just talking about Kautilya's Arthashastra, when Bhishma is lying down on his bed of arrows, and instructs Yudhishthira in Shanti Parva and Anushashan Parva, it is very, very similar to the kinds of issues we would be talking about. So, in fact, that leads almost neatly to what my next question was, which is that contemporary conversation around India's ancient past almost resembles the Kurukshetra battlefield because you have two very polarized views. You have one it, it almost seems to fall into history versus myth, bunkum versus reason. How do you read this conflict between the multiple narratives of India's ancient past and where it should exist in public consciousness today? Well, a proper answer to that question would probably take much more time than we have today. But my plea to everyone who's taking positions on whichever side of this debate is please read the texts. <coughs> Excuse me, let's first try and understand what the texts say and most of the time when people are taking positions, these positions are being taken by people who have not read the texts. The word used particularly for the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, originally for the Mahabharata and subsequently for the Ramayana also, is that they are not myths because the word used is itihasa. Itihasa means itihi asa. This is indeed what happened. Now, this does not mean that everything happened exactly the way it is described, but certainly I do believe that sure there were embellishments in the process of oral transmission, sure there were exaggerations, but both of these, they represent a core element of fact. Do you have a favorite epic? Do I? Do you have a favorite epic? You're comparing the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, oh, uh, these, well, these, these particular, these two. Well, we must understand that all of these were poetry. None of these was in prose. Of course, Sanskrit poetry had a very, very specific structure. But you must understand that these two poets were very different in nature. Veda Vyasa as a poet was not interested in describing nature. Veda Vyasa was very, very matter of fact. So and so came, so and so did that, so and so shot, so and so. He didn't waste time over nature. Valmiki was naturally very, very prone to describing nature. So if I'm judging the quality of poetry, the quality of poetry in Valmiki is superlative. It's impossible to capture that in any translation. Whereas Veda Vyasa, although it's in poetry, is almost akin to prose for the most part. So uh, you said before that Valmiki, I mean, the descriptions of nature are almost lyrical. But, but to that extent, is it because the Mahabharat seems a substantially more complex text? No, no, no. It's, it, as I said, it's the nature of the poet. It is indeed true that the Ramayana, by when I say Ramayana, I mean the Valmiki Ramayana. The Ramayana is more like a story, whereas the Mahabharat is a bit more like a novel. What do I mean by that? A story, even if it is a long story, normally depicts everything from the perspective of a single individual. And the Valmiki Ramayana is essentially Rama's story, which is, called, which is why it's called Ramayana, Rama's progress. Whereas the Mahabharata 
it, it's not just that it has many more protagonists, but it describes the incidents from the perspective of more than one of these protagonists, which is why I said it's a bit more like a novel. But when I said what I did about poetry, it is just that these two poets were completely different kinds of poets. So uh, just, and before moving on, I think it may help to understand, you have used the critical editions uh, of both the Valmiki Ramayana and the Mahabharat as the foundations for your translations. Would you explain the role of the uh, critical editions and why it was important to agree on the foundational text, or rather why there are so, mul so many multiple versions? Are they substantially different? And why is the critical edition the one to start from? Both of these are in Sanskrit. And as I said earlier, this was in the form of oral transmission. Writing came much later. And certainly writing in Devanagari is of very recent vintage. So when they were written down, even if they happened to be in Sanskrit, they were written down in different scripts. Typically, not Devanagari. And therefore, over a period of time, let's talk about the Mahabharata first. Over a period of time, different versions of the Mahabharata evolved. These were not significantly different from each other, but they differed in minor details. Did Veda Vyasa actually dictate it to Ganesha? Just one example of that. Some versions said it did, some versions said it did not. There is an Oriental Research Institute in Pune, known as the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. In the year 1916, the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute sat down to undertake an exercise, which is to sit down with all of these different versions of the Mahabharata, and there were about 1215 of these, 1215 of these floating around in the country, they decided to sit down with all of these to try and sift through them and try and determine which was as close as possible to the original. And the way they did it is something very reminiscent of, of, some, of, of a phenomenon we studied, of a technique we studied in school, which you tend to forget, which is HCF, highest common factor. In other words, if a shloka occurred in a large number of versions, then it was probably in the original. Now, obviously, this is subjective, but having done this, this is what the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute did, and it took them 50 years. So, over a period of 50 years, they produced this critical edition. There is an Oriental Research Institute in Baroda. The Baroda Research Institute did something very similar for the Ramayana, and this was in the 70s. There were about 200 odd versions of the Valmiki Ramayana floating around. So they sat down and produced the critical edition. No one is suggesting that the critical edition is perfect. There have been criticisms of both critical editions. But the moment anyone does any research, they normally tend to use the critical editions. So when I was going to translate, I had to choose which edition. And because of the acceptability for both the Mahabharata and the Valmiki Ramayana, I chose the critical editions. So my question leading from that is, when there is so much contestation uh, about uh, you know, different people who follow different versions of either the Valmiki Ramayana or the Mahabharata, routinely kind of argue about the details, are we losing sight of what the epics are really about by becoming literal readers? And to some extent, do, should we be reading them more like literary works than to get caught up in um, debating them from a religious or a ritualistic standpoint, because in that we seem to go in to get the wrong end of the stick, you know, particular incidents or particular characters or particular situations that you say, for example, don't appear in the critical edition of, say, the Valmiki Ramayana, but actually exist in popular memory. Is it even important? I think it's important because in both the Ramayana, Valmiki Ramayana, and the Mahabharata, and by the way, I should say this, that there were people who were unhappy with what Valmiki had depicted in the Valmiki Ramayana. When they were unhappy, they simply came along and composed another Ramayana. And in Sanskrit, there are four and a half 
such Ramayans in Sanskrit. Forget the vernacular. Vernacular, there are many more. So when one is reacting to an event, one must be careful that is one referring to the Valmiki Ramayana or to something else. The Mahabharata is not like that because there is only one Mahabharata. Some years ago, we used to travel on trains and often use hold dolls. The Mahabharata is a bit like hold dolls. Anything that came along was put into the Mahabharata. So it expanded. But one of the things that comes across very strongly in the Ramayana, in the Mahabharata and also in the Puranas is there is no absolute notion of morality and what is right. It is all very, very individual specific. Now let me give an example of that to illustrate what I mean. We all know about Bhishma. Bhishma had a vow of Brahmacharya celibacy. At that time, to cut the long story short, at that time the princess of Kashi Amba told Bhishma that if you do not marry me, I will kill myself, I will immolate myself in the fire and it is up to you to decide which dharma is more important for you protecting your vow of brahmacharya or protecting the life of a woman. Bhishma said, brahmacharya is more important to me and therefore Amba immolated herself and we know that she became Shikhandi and later on led to Bhisha's destruction. Some people may not know that Arjuna had a temporary vow of brahmacharya for one year. It was a temporary vow. At that point, the princess of the Nagas, Ulupi, fell in love with Arjuna and said, if you do not marry me, I am going to kill myself. So here we have two Kshatriyas, both observing vows of Brahmacharya and both faced with this conflict of Dharma. In Arjuna's case, Arjuna decides to marry Ulupi. Now this strand, that at certain level, dharma is what you choose, what you decide, and you bear the consequences of that decision. This comes across very strongly in all of our texts. So anyone who says, or anyone who thinks, there was an absolute notion of morality, has not read the text. Let me tell you a story. There was a sage who was prone to anger. He got angry very easily. And his name was Vishamitra. People on earth had been very wicked. And because they had been very wicked, it had not rained. Indra was angry and it had not rained for 12 years. Because it had not rained for 12 years, there was no food, there was drought, there was famine. Vishamitra could not feed himself, he could not feed his wife, he could not feed his children. So he wandered around in search of food. Soon he came upon a village of Chandalas. It was not actually a village of Chandalas, it was a village of Swapakas, but for present purpose I am using the words Swapaka and Chandala as synonymous, although they aren't. He came upon this village of Chandalas and there he came upon a Chandalas house. In the courtyard of that Chandala's house, there was a rope and from that rope hung the carcass of a dog because the Sopakas kept dogs, they also ate dogs. The Chandala or Sopaka had eaten, had killed a dog, had eaten the four quarters and the hind quarters was hanging there from that rope. Vishamitra waited. He was waiting for the Chandala to fall asleep and then he would creep in, steal that. The Chandala went to sleep, Vishamitra tiptoes in, tries to take it away, but there are other dogs around who are awake other, and the other dogs who are alive and they began to yap. So the Chandala wakes up and says, who are you? Vishamitra says, I am the sage Vishamitra. Chandala says, I bow down to you, sage, what can I do for you? 
Vishamitra says, I'm hungry, I'm going to steal this carcass because I have to feed my wife and sons. For several chapters, a dialogue ensues between Vishamitra and the Chandala. Where the Chandala keeps saying, you are a Brahmana, you are a Rishi, you should not eat flesh. If you eat flesh, you should not eat the flesh of a dog, which is a polluted creature. If you eat the flesh of a dog, you should not eat the hindquarters, which is more polluted than the front quarters. And Vishamitra keeps saying, dharma comes later. First, let me remain alive, then we'll think about dharma. After this conversation goes on, Vishamitra asks, Chandala, tell me who am I? Am I my physical body or am I my Atman? And who is eating the dog meat? If my physical body is eating the dog meat, and if I am not the physical body but the Atman, how am I getting polluted? To which the Chandala says, Oh sage, I do not know the answer to this question. Please take it away. And this is an illustration of what I meant, that dharma in all of these instances is relative and every individual we are talking about faces a conflict of dharma. And because you face that conflict of dharma, you take one decision and face the consequences. So dharma and karma, they are flip sides of the same coin. You've also said um, that, and I think particular to the Ramayana, to the Valmiki Ramayana, one forgets that it was written over a very, very long duration. Um, you have said that the epics themselves, in some cases, are not internally consistent. So also, essentially, as I said of Hinduism, everything you can argue, its opposite is also argued within. Would you give us an example of what you mean? Let, let's draw a careful distinction because between whenever these events are said to have occurred and between the composition of the texts, because the two are not the same. These two texts in particular, they attain their final form to the extent we can determine that by around the 5th century AD or ACE. But they clearly evolved over a period of at least 1000 years. Over a period of 1000 years, attitudes changed, norms changed, all kinds of things changed. So for example, you take something like attitude to women. I can cite chapter and verse from the Mahabharata because it's larger and also from the Valmiki Ramayana to say women were oppressed. I can cite chapter and verse to say women were liberated. And therefore I find this entire thing very sterile. In fact, the Mahabharata says that there was a sage named Shetaketu. And Shetaketu's father was Uddalak, the sage Uddalak. Shetaketu suddenly discovered one day a strange man, a man does not, he, man he did not know, came along, looked at his mother and said, come let's go. And the mother goes away to enjoy herself with this strange man. So Shetaketu goes to his father Uddalak and says, what is this? I mean, my mother has gone off with this strange man. And uh, Uddalak says, but that's the way it is. She's gone away to amuse herself. She'll be back when she's done with it. And the Mahabharata tells us, Shetaketu said, this is not done. And Shetaketu is the one who therefore devised the system of marriage interpreted as chastity or faithfulness. Oh good, now we have someone to blame. <laughs> um, okay, a couple of strands, but just to come to the translation bit. What are the particular challenges of translating a language? No two languages encompass the same range of words, also language is also experience, and languages composed thousands of years ago often encompass experiences that more contemporary languages don't. How did you translate things that there may not even be words for? And what, is there a particular either section of any of these epics or a particular epic that you found harder to translate? Well, first do realize that what I'm translating is not literature in its narrow sense. I'm not trying to translate Kalidasa. And the reason it is important is translating Kalidasa where a sentence extends over 10 shlokas is extremely, extremely difficult. 
these texts that I'm translating, they're relatively simpler. The subject is where you expect it to be, the verb is where you expect it to be, the object is where you expect it to be. The sentences are not more than 20 words, so they're about. So these are simpler texts. The first call you have to take is since these, these are poetry, do you use verse? I consciously took a decision not to use verse because if you tried to use verse, you'd have to take liberties with the text. And therefore, it was a conscious decision to translate them in prose. The translations I have done does not have the Sanskrit, but it's a word-for-word -word translation. So if you sat down with the, original trans with the original Sanskrit, you'd have a perfect match, which means perforce, consciously, the English is not as smooth as it might have been had I not tried to render this word for word matching. Indeed, there are certain words which cannot be translated. Dharma is one such word, karma is one such word. I have not even attempted to translate them. So there are certain words which I have retained as they are in the Sanskrit, except the first time I use them, I've tried to explain what they may mean using footnotes. Otherwise, there are some words that are indeed cannot, cannot be translated. These are all texts about dharma, whatever be the definition of dharma. And there are indeed problems. When I look at a certain sentence, 90% of the time, there will not be any difficulty in understanding what it means, assuming you know the Sanskrit. 5% of the cases you will have a problem because Sanskrit has a language, has multiple meanings for the same word. And I don't intend to bore you, but let me say the following. In Sanskrit, the meanings of words are determined by the verbal roots. So, for example, if it's a tree, and one of the words for a tree is padapa. So, to anyone who knows Sanskrit, padapa conjures up the meaning not just of a tree, but padapa means something that drinks with its feet. So, when someone is using the word padapa, it means drinking with the feet. So, this chair in Sanskrit would be called asandaha which means something that gives you a posture. So when I see asanda, it's not just any chair, it is giving me a posture. Similarly, take a word like ajagar. Aja is a goat, and the normal translation of ajagar would be a boa constrictor, a python. But technically, anything that swallows a goat, even if it is a crocodile, could be an ajagar. So sometimes you have to sift through those different meanings to try and figure out which meaning is the most appropriate. And sometimes you have to sit down because you're foxed and you don't really know what this word means in a particular context because after all it was composed 2000 years ago and that is what takes a lot of time. So just a quick shift to, to maybe the epics that get talked about a little less, the Puranas, the Bhagavad Puranas, and you have just set out on a rather, and the only word for it is epic task, to now translate the unabridged Puranas. I think there are 18 volumes, you said, or 18 Puranas. In, in complete scale or scope, that would be four times the size of the Mahabharat. But what is the landscape of the Puranas? What is, the, what is contained within and what is its significance both in the context of the other epics as well as to contemporary life? Unlike the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, I think on an average people have a very imperfect understanding of the Puranas because our impression of the Puranas is based on whatever we've read in Amar Chitra Katha or watched on television and we reduce the Puranas to stories. A Purana is supposed to have five characteristics for it to be classified as a Purana. It has to describe the original creation, 
it has to describe the subsequent cycles of periodical creation and destruction it has to describe the different eras known as manantaras it has to describe the genealogies of the gods and the rishis and it has to describe the solar and lunar dynasties all the puranas do this but they do much much more than that they are encyclopedias when we think of whatever hinduism means we tend to reduce it often to vedanta the upanishads but vedanta upanishads brahmanas aranyakas they were composed by who they were composed by people who had retired on vanaprastha and sanyas they had gone off to the forest the vast majority of the popula population then did exactly what they are doing today they earned money presumably under according to legitimate means and they prospered they tried to improve their lives what was dharma for them the dharma for them is described in the puranas and many of the things that we practice all the time although we realize it or not they are based on the puranas the way we construct temples is based on the matsya purana the funeral ceremonies are based on the garud purana there's a vast amount of material on geography so they are real encyclopedias and the tragedy is the puranas several of the puranas have never been translated into english there are some that i suspect have not been translated even into the vernacular languages in unabridged form you have abridged versions so in my view there is an enormous storehouse of knowledge that requires to be translated that requires to be read and therefore it requires to be thereafter digested so before we and i think that's the signal we'll move to audience questions but one epic we have not touched on and that we seem to have a very special relationship with is the bhagavad gita as indians it seems almost uh, it's linked with individual identities with family identities how do you read the bhagavad gita both its significance for the individual and again vis-a-vis -vis the other epics well i've used the word dharma and the word dharma means multiple things at one level the word dharma means what these texts refer to as moksha dharma that is liberation emancipation from this cycle of existence that is known as sansar the bhagavad gita is one of several texts there were there were several texts that were known as the gita gita simply means it is sung the mahabharata itself has 11 different gitas including the bhagavad gita the fundamental question in the bhagavad gita that is asked is who am i where have i come from why am i here where am i going to go in soliciting an answer to this question what i am supposed to do what i am expected to do is to reflect inwards and think inwards spend some time every day with my own self i think one of the great disasters that has happened to human civilization is the invention of language because we are perpetually talking or writing perpetually sending messages saying read my article watch my interview and not spending enough time with your own self most of the time we are obsessed with relationships with external entities external objects external possessions external individuals so i'm extremely skeptical of people who write things saying bhagavad gita for management bhagavad gita for day to day life bhagavad gita in dealing with your boss bhagavad gita in dealing with your subordinate that's not what the bhagavad gita is it's about your own self and what a person learns from the bhagavad gita or what a person learns from any of the other gitas is entirely a function of that individual i'll move to audience questions thank you um and then before we close 
I would love to come back and ask you how you have been changed as a person with your engagement. But if I may first go to the audience questions. And there are three questions from uh, a gentleman called Sanjay Banka. But if I may paraphrase, I think he is, his, his prime concern is, he says, over the years, a mindset has been made that both the Mahabharata and Ramayana are myth and not history. How do we rectify this mindset? The second is how do we inspire confidence of the young generation in the historicity of these epics? And then, of course, he says the Congress government filed an affidavit that there was no Lord Ram, and Ram Setu was a natural phenomenon. But as we now know and agree that Ramayana is history and not myth. So I think primarily his question is, where do you place them as history or as myth? And also, it might be useful to have a, of a, a definition of wherever you place them. What is myth, if it is myth? Or what is history? Is it verifiable, or is it what we choose to collectively believe? I already said this, that I believe there is a core element of truth by which it does not mean that everything happened exactly as it is described. For example, Ashwatthama's mother was Kripacharya's sister, Kripi, and she was married to Drona. Vedavyasa tells us that Kripi's teeth jutted out and she had, her hair was thinning seems a very irrelevant piece of detail and it suggests to me, and this is just one example, it suggests to me that some real person was being described, otherwise why talk about the teeth jutting out and the hair thinning. We are talking about the core incident. Now let's take one example of that and the core incident in this case is dating of the Kurukshetra battle. Astronomical data are very, very unreliable because astronomical data within the texts are very inconsistent and also compounded by the fact of the precession of the equinoxes. So let's leave the astronomical data out. If you take the astronomical data, I can date it to 2552 BC to 3102 BC. Let's leave the astronomical data out. If I leave out the astronomical data, there are four or five different techniques you can use to date the Kurukshetra war. First is the genealogy as described in the Puranas, because the genealogy describes the number of years that had passed since the accession of Parikshit to the accession of Mahapadmananda, an event vetted by external sources. Then you have information on geological changes. You have information on the basis of excavations, archaeological excavations that have recently thrown up much more of artifacts going back to that period. You have information on the way the language, the Sanskrit language evolved over a period of time. You even have some genetic evidence now. Contrary to what you might think, all of these multiple sources zero in on the Kurukshetra battle having happened somewhere between 1400 BC and 1100 BC. So that's a pretty narrow range. So a lot of information is turning up on the basis of newer and newer knowledge and therefore I will reiterate what I said earlier that I think there is a lot of history there which does not mean that everything is history but it's history we need to explore instead of dismissing everything, saying that this is myth. Pratip Sen wants to know, how would religion in India today be different if Valmiki Ramayan had been the primary version and not been eclipsed by the latter Tulsidas Ramayan? I don't like the word religion, by the way. Uh, because religion, etymologically, suggests a certain set of rules. The nature of our dharma always has been, at least that's my interpretation, that there is nothing that is absolute. It is for you to figure out what dharma is. And I gave examples of that. 
which is the reason why when our rishi spoke about whatever it is that they had experienced they never said this is the ultimate truth they always said this is what i have experienced vedaha metam and what i experienced might be completely different from what you experienced so there is this great degree of latitude because different people have different experiences if you do not misunderstand my choice of words these texts therefore are very empirical almost and i wish people imbibe this lesson obviously tulsidas as ramcharit manas has a certain view of rama which is slightly different from the way rama is viewed in the valmiki ramayan dharma in the last resort is also about faith and different people have different takes on faith but my plea to everyone and i keep repeating myself is play, please let us read the texts in the original for the nuances please let us appreciate what the text stood for on religion and on dharma before we take positions and on that just the last question which was have you found yourself changed with your engagement with the epics and in what way well, i've been asked this question before so i will give the answer that i invariably give except it makes no sense here today i say that i am the last person who's competent to answer that question you should ask my wife the question <laughs> and the answer is that yes these texts do change you if i were to try and answer they change you not in terms of what you have gained but they change you in terms of what you have lost and what you lose are things that are driven by immediate triggers for example anger and rage i am no longer as prone to losing my temper as i used to earlier so yes you do change thank you mr de broy and i think <laughs> it's hard it's hardly for me to paraphrase that conversation but i think if there is a distinct takeaway it is often the questions we have are answered within the text and the challenge of arriving at a definitive position is in fact not the one as much as to have the ability to read the text absorb its complexity both the parts that you will agree with and both the parts that you will not agree with so i don't think the external conversation around the texts is as important as diving into them and having the internal conversations is what i think you've said thank you so much we'll take a 15 minute break before we come back for our second conversation